It's just like, man, what, what direction do we go in on, uh, on Father's Day? And so, uh, interestingly enough, as, as, as the Lord can only, uh, only work, at least uh, in, in Sunday school this morning, we're going to talk about suffering, um, right? What could, what could go wrong with suffering in Father's Day, right? Um, but, uh, but, but, I mean, truthfully, it's like, I, I think for us both as, you know, I mean, well, A, first and foremost, Happy Father's Day to all you gentlemen in the room, man. Grateful, uh, grateful you guys are here. Because um, I mean, again, I, I, I can, I can barely think of anything for for us as dads that that's an incredibly helpful and positive step for us, both as leaders of our family. Um, and leaders within this community than to be right here. So I appreciate y'all being, uh, being up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to deal with a, uh, an armless Southerner. Um, so, so, so God bless you guys. If you get a lot of y'alls out of me, that, that one's on me. Um, but, you know, as, as we look to, I think for, for us as men, just how we lead both our families, how we lead in our church. But, I mean, truthfully, for all of us as believers— I think suffering plays an incredibly important role in in how we pursue Christ and and, and in how we grow and and, and mature. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, um, I I would encourage you to turn with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we're going to be. And this is, um, this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. Um, This is is a church that that in a lot of ways, they've they've got their warts shall we say. The Corinthian church, there's lots of speed bumps in their life, you know, and, and, and they're working through a lot of things. But then here at the end of the second letter that Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, he, he's trying to encourage them, I, I, I think, in a lot of ways through, through the overflow of his story. And if there's anything about the Apostle Paul that we know, th- this dude suffered a whole lot. Um, you know, it's like we don't we don't know a lot of things uh, about Paul personally, apart from the fact that this dude has a PhD in suffering in, in every conceivable way. And so here in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is um, he, he, he's facing something that he only describes as his thorn in the flesh. Something that, that he says it torments him, it, uh, it, it frustrates him. And, and so here, read with me 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 8. And in talking about this thorn in the flesh, Paul says this, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so I I think in here, here, there's just a few things that that I want us to, almost like handles on a suitcase, just for us to take away and and be able to pick up this text and and, and walk this out. And the the first thing that I want us to see is as we look at our own life, as, as we look at the suffering that we have to face, I think for, for the believer, it's incredibly important for us to see grace in the midst of the groaning, um, for, for us to see grace just in the midst of, of, of the grind of life that we, that we have to go, come up against. Because it's like, I, I think first and foremost, it's so incredibly important for us to see here, Paul this is, a, I mean, this is obviously a man of faith. This is obviously a, a man that, that God is using in tremendous ways. And yet, as Paul bumps up against what I, I think a lot of people would describe, this, this is Paul's greatest pain point, whatever this thorn in the flesh is. And Paul is pleading. This isn't just like a prayer, like, dear Lord, like if you, if, if you, would, if you would find it in, in, your, in your kindness to take this away, like Paul is, Paul is frustrated, Paul is hurt, Paul is like crying out, pleading to the Lord, like, God, this is all I can handle. God, this is, this is even more than I can handle. And I love the Lord's reply. Like in the midst of it, it's not like, it's not God shames him. It's not that like God calls out Paul's faith. God's simple reply is my grace is sufficient for you. It's just his, his very simple, simple reply. Now listen, like, I, 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 think, I think it's funny that of all the things that the Lord could say, he doubles down on grace. 
Because if, if there's anybody in the world that knows about grace, it's Paul. If you look back in the, in, the, in the first letter that he writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's writing again. This is the same church here in Corinth. And Paul says, listen, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I brought to you, of the gospel that you received, of the gospel in which you're being saved, of the gospel in which you're, 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 you're standing. So Paul, again, is like hearkening the church back to the gospel of God's grace. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, it's by the grace of God that I am what I am. If there's anything about Paul, it's that grace is kind of his thing. But somewhere along the line, like he, he lost sight of it. Somewhere along the line, in the midst of the groaning, in the midst of the hurt, in the midst of the frustration, Paul had to be reminded again of just that God is still good even when our circumstances aren't. And, and, and I think for a lot of us, that's a, that, I think that's a lesson to inscribe on our heart. Like, I, I would dare say a good chunk of us in here, we might say life right now is not very good. We, we would not characterize it as sunshine and rainbows and happiness. I mean, others of us, we might be in a good spot or like, we're, we're okay. But I mean, here's the thing, sooner or later, the trial is coming, the tribulation is coming, the frustration is coming. And I think for us to be able to, to grip on to the grace of God, to be able to inscribe it on our heart, that, that's how we endure. Because like, y'all, I, I think back and I mean, and interestingly enough, I think within my story and, and especially with, with my disability, like I'll, 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 talk, I'll talk more about just, just my story here, here in the worship service in a little while. I mean, as you would expect, so suffering is very much so a part of my story in so many ways. Like I've gotten very used to, as Paul kind of lays out all of his sufferings that he's faced in the chapter before this in 2 Corinthians 11, I kind of sympathize with Paul. Like I can, I can walk through all of the things that, that I've had to deal with and, and all the frustration that I've faced, but it's all been, it's all been like really personal suffering. You know, it's like, I can, I can lace things up by my bootstraps and grind, grind through things. But it's like, for, for me, especially recently, you know, in, in, in probably the past, like, decade of my life, corporate suffering is, I think, a place where, where the Lord has been molding me and shaping me. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm married. I, I'm married to my wife, Heather. We've been married 16 years. Um, we, have a, we have a 10-year-old boy, 6-year-old little girl. Um, and, uh, and so interestingly enough with both of those pregnancies or my wife was pregnant with both kids for, for some bizarre reason, her body grew these benign tumors, um, that attached to the uterus. The, the first, our, our oldest, uh, her first pregnancy, by the time they, they had caught the tumor, it was about the size of a beach ball in, inside of my wife. And so they, they had to do this incredibly invasive surgery where basically the, the doctor in laying out, you know, you know how it is with, with a lot of these, they lay out the statistical probabilities of complications or mortality rate. For, for our son, it was a 60% mortality rate that this surgery was going to take his life. For my wife, it was a 30% mortality rate. And so we're sitting here as, as we're prayerfully just going through this, and it's like, so you're telling me there's a chance, there, there's, there's a decent chance that I'm never going to meet my son. There's a chance that, that I could lose my wife. Or there's, there's a chance that, that, that I go home from the hospital as a widower and not having a kid. And, you know, it's like, at, at this point in, in my life, I've, I've been in ministry a decade and a half. You know, I spent my whole life telling people about the grace of God and that he's enough and that he's sufficient and that he's good. And, and I'll never forget kissing my wife and, and, you know, they wheel her back for the surgery. And, and of all days, I'm, I'm from North Carolina. And so we're not like Pennsylvania. It's rarely ever cold. It never snows. If it snows, it's the apocalypse, you know. Um, and, uh, and so... This morning, like this one morning of all things, we got seven inches of snow in one morning. So I end up like I, I, I was going to have some, a few friends that were going to come and sit with me in the waiting room, pray with me, love on me. Your boy got to sit by himself and watch the snow, you know. And so my wife and my son, they're, they're back in the OR and, and I'm sitting by myself in the waiting room. 
And y'all know how it is. A lot of times you get alone with your thoughts and bad things happen, you know? And, and, and I just started, just as I processed through it all, it's like, Lord, I know you're good. Lord, I, I, know, I know you hold the world in, in, in your hand. But God, what do I do if I come away with this without ever being able to kiss my son? Or God, what do I do if, 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 if I lose my best friend? Like, God, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I want to say like, yeah, God, I'm good. Yeah, God, the, you, you're still glorious. You're still amazing. But in those moments, it's hard to say. And, and I mean, by the grace of God, you know, my, my, my son and my wife survived the surgery. But as I wrestled with and, and prayed through just, just that groaning and that hurt, it, it, was the, it was the reality for me that God was gracious enough and kind enough that even up and until that point, man, to have a wife who loves a, a, a bald, bearded, armless man, I mean, that in and of itself is, is, a, is a measure of God's grace, right? Um, to, uh, to, to, to even, man, to even have the promise of, of having a child. I mean, for me to look back in, into the early years of my life, it, that just didn't seem conceivable. And I think in, in that moment for me to even count the grace of God in my life up and until that point was what kept my eyes cast toward what was ahead. And so I think the same is for us. Like you, you might be sitting in the, in the midst of a lot of frustration, a lot of hurt, a lot of groaning. But sometimes that, that hurt has, has a very insulating and isolating effect on us. You know, it's like, I, I, I don't know how many of you guys are horse people or, or have inter, ever interacted with horse, horses before, but sometimes like to keep a horse from spooking, you'll, you'll keep blinders on them. Um, it, it'll keep a, a, a horse's vision right in front of them. It, it kind of keeps them more stable, more focused. But I feel like a lot of times it's our hurt that puts these blinders on us, but not in a good way. Like our hurt and our trials at times just keeps us singularly focused on what went wrong and we miss what's gone right we miss that picture like we see in verse 9 right there that his grace is sufficient his grace is present like that word sufficient it draws this picture of like the lord spreading a tent over you that his grace is your home his grace is your protection his grace is good his grace is all-encompassing and so I think for us, man, find the grace in the midst of what you're having to face. Find the grace in the midst of your groans. Second thing I want us to see this morning, and again, it's, it's, it's just, it is a very backwards way in terms of what the world understands it, but for us to boast in our weakness, for us to boast in our weakness, you know, it's like Paul here, when, when he's saying, when he's saying in verse 9 and, and in verse 10 to, to just to boast in, in, in our trials, to boast in our hurt, like he's literally saying to, to glory in it. And now again, like you, you want to talk about backwards thinking. If, if from the world's understanding, if Paul is going to glory in something, it should be glorying in the fact that here's like the original church planner. You know, in, in 2022, it's really cool to be a church planner. You know, it's really cool to be a guy who like starts a school in a high school or, or start a church in a high school and then you grow into like your own building and then you move on from there. Like Paul was the forerunner of this. No, nobody knew what church planning was and Paul was that guy and Paul successfully did it. This is the guy that um, God is using to pen the vast majority of the New Testament. Paul has done some really incredible things. Paul has seen God work in amazing ways. And what does Paul say? I'm not gonna glory in any of that. I'm gonna glory in my hurt. I'm gonna glory in my weakness because it's in that moment where I realize I don't got this. I don't have this. Like he does. And I think you, you see it here in Corinthians, you see it in Philippians. Over and over when we see the joy that comes from Christ, it's a joy that comes when we realize my life and my sufficiency is not dependent on me and it's fully dependent on him, the creator and sustainer of the universe. And so I think for a lot of us, as we look at the things that have gone wrong, as we look at the things that we're walking through right now, how many of us really talk about it? 
you know, if we're honest, like, you, you know, you came in those double doors a few minutes ago. And what, what, what's, what's our Sunday rhythms? You know, it's like we come in, we see the, the church greeter or the deacons or, or, or the guys that you know here in church. And it's going to be good morning. And, and now listen, I don't, I don't know if y'all are, y'all are Southern like me, but I don't do this very well for obvious reasons. Um, but you come in, you shake someone's hand, which I'm terrible at. Um, you know, you, uh, you, you, uh, you, you, tell, you tell them good morning. And then what's, what's the inevitable question? How you doing? How's things going? What do we always say? I'm good. I'm fine. You're fine. The dog's fine. Everybody's fine. You know, it's just kind of, it's just the way we're wired. But how many of us, when we say that, we know the, the, the war that we're going to go home to? Or we know the insecurity and the fear that we're walking through. And I think sometimes it's like as, as, we're, as we're navigating the, the things that we face in this life, we're missing an incredible opportunity, as Paul writes to the church in Galatia, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. As we boast in our weakness, as we boast in our trial, sometimes that just means putting it out there. Being able to share with the people that God has brought together in this body of believers to say, this is what I have going on. I'm, like, I need your prayers. I need your encouragement. I need your love. I need your support. God has given you a support structure just in the people in these pews. And, and, and they can't stand behind you unless they know what's going on, un- unless we're willing to be vulnerable. But then here's the second thing, that, that in the midst of boasting in this weakness, we also have an incredible ministry opportunity. Like the things that you're walking through right now, whether it's depression or insecurity or financial stress or some sort of health situation, God is also giving you a remarkable opportunity to talk about how his comfort and strength is applied to your life. Paul says it at the very beginning of this book. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, um, verses 3 through 4 and then 7. You don't have to turn there, but just listen. As Paul starts off his letter to the Corinthians, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may, may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which ourselves are comforted by God. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So, you know, in in the things that you have to overcome and walk through and navigate, you get a unique opportunity to talk about how the grace of God is applied to your life and how that hope spreads to others. And y'all, it's like, man, I've I've, I've seen it very much so firsthand. It's, It's like for me, like my, my affliction and my trial, I, I literally wear it like two flags on my shoulders. You know, it's like people can, people can very clearly see that your boy's been through some stuff, you know. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of people will make assumptions very quickly like, oh, he's had a hard life. Oh, he's, he should be miserable. Oh, you know, he, he, he probably doesn't have a lot of joy. He probably doesn't like people, which that might not be a... Fair assessment. Um, but, you know, it's like when people see me, they assume that I should be somebody who's bitter and frustrated. And then as they start to interact with me because of the work of Christ, they see somebody who actually has some joy and who enjoys the life that God has given them. And, and in, in the worldly sense, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't add up. And so when people see my brokenness and yet they see joy, they want to know what I'm drinking. You know, they, they, like they, they want that Kool-Aid. And, and so for me, it's an incredible opportunity that it's like, y'all, I would dare say daily, daily, like whether I'm at the gas station, whether I'm at the grocery store, whether I'm in the airport, people want to know the hope that I have. They want to know how did I get from being an armless afterthought to somebody who's living the life that God has given them. They want, they want what I have. And so when we boast in our weakness, when we start talking about the things that we've been through in our life and how God is either getting us through it actively or how God has gotten us through it, it's the opportunity for us to show the world, man, you, you can have what I have. 
You can share in the comfort that I have in Christ because the same comfort that God has given me is the same comfort that he can give you. Boast in your weakness. And the last thing I want us to see is this. It's like for us, we look to him for, for both our contentment and power. Again, if you look down in the text, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with hardships, with persecutions, with calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's not for your sake. It's not for your family's sake. It's not for your job's sake. Not for your community's sake. Not for your good name. It's for the sake of Christ that we're able to walk through this laundry list of things that Paul just lays out. The only way that we endure, the only way that, that we're content, and it's, and it's crazy, that word content, it literally means to prefer, to choose, that for us in Christ, we would choose calamity and persecution and hardship, because as he goes on to say, it's in that moment when I realize I'm dependent, that's when I'm strong. That's when the grace of God shows up and carries me along. And, and y'all, so it is for us. You, you see this all through the New Testament. You see in Hebrews 12, let, our, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him goes to the cross to rescue and redeem each and every one of us. For us to be content, for us to choose that, that place where we're gonna rest in Christ. It's to see how he has loved us for his sake. And I mean, truthfully, you even see this in 2 Corinthians chapter five. It's like, as, as we look for our own sake, but then we see in 2 Corinthians five, it is for our sake that, that God made him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So here we see that it is for our sake that we are looking to him and yet for our sake he dies, he, he's resurrected that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Here we see a love and pursuit on our behalf in the person and work of Christ and that it is, it is in our hope, it is in our life that we look to him to make him our everything. Y'all, our contentment, our strength, our hope is built up all in Christ. Because again, think to Philippians chapter 4. Paul, as, as he's sitting in prison, as he writes the book of Philippians, he says this in, in Philippians 4 verses 11 through 13. Here you see both strength and contentment going hand in hand. Paul says, not that I am speaking of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation that I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Our strength and hope comes from him. It does not come from us. Don't, don't, don't try to grind your way through your trial or like grit it out. Man, when, when we go to hard times and, and step into hard places, sometimes that's, that's the best opportunity for us to just take a step back and to go, he's enough. He's got me. He's with me. He's my strength. Man, cast your eyes to him in the midst of the things that you're walking through. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you so incredibly much um, just for this morning. God, we thank you so much just uh, for your grace in the midst of our hurt. For your grace in the midst of our groaning, Father, I just pray that this morning, whatever season that we're in, whether we are in a season of plenty, whether we are in a season of insecurity, that God, we may know that you are enough, that you love us, and that you care for us. And God, I pray we look to you and we trust in you, no matter what lies ahead for each and every one of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we, we've got a few minutes, especially be, before worship. And so I would love, man, just to just give you guys an opportunity. You had to hear me blab uh, for, for about a half an hour. And so I would, I would love to just give you guys an opportunity uh, just for us to interact. Um, and so full disclosure, man, I'm an open book. Um, and, and so if you've just got that burning armless question, like, how does homeboy mow the lawn? Um, like I am, I, you're, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. I will, I, will I, I, I do middle school, like public school assemblies all the time. So I can guarantee you your questions are not gonna, are not gonna even come close 
to, to, what, to what, those kids, what, what those kids have to ask. So, so, so we'll be good. But I mean, truthfully, if you want to swim in the deep end, if we want to talk more about suffering or scripture or theology, I mean, man, y'all, y'all, y'all can dictate how this goes. But I, w- I would love to, um, men, just, you know, ra- raise your hands and, and we'll just walk through some stuff. So does any, anybody have any, any questions at all? Yes, sir. Oh man, yeah, that, that's, that's an incredibly good question. Um, you know, I think I, I, I had a student pastor um, that, that led me to Christ in my teens. Um, and he was just such a faithful dude in, like he, he wasn't just the guy that got up on stage and like preached or, or led small groups or whatever. He was, he was a big advocate of just like sitting down and talking with you. And, and man, he, he just very faithfully I think uh, did a great job of applying scripture to my life, like understanding what my identity in Christ meant. Um, but then I think too, just how that plays out interpersonally, because it's like, if if I'm honest, um, I'm <laughs> I, I, I phrase it this way: I'm a recovering people hater um, for sure. Like I, uh, you know, it's like I, I spent the first 15 years of my life hating people um, just because of. And I mean, y'all know, if you're, you're different in, in any way, shape, or form in, in modern society, the world lets you know. And so it made me very jaded. And, and this man just really sat with me and in laying out just what the fruit of the spirit, what it starts to behold in like being loving towards others, being patient towards others, being kind toward others. I think he played a, he played a big role in, in my life and not making excuses towards being a jerk, you know? I mean, I mean, truthfully, it's like, I lived my life not not living by excuses physically. He did a really good job of reminding me that spiritually we don't have any excuse because of the grace of Christ. And, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that uh, he, he held my feet to the fire on that one. That's, that's for sure. So what else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, truthfully, the, the, the best way I can describe it, what you guys do with your hands, I do with my feet. Um, so, so personal hygiene is nice because I don't have much hair to shampoo. Um, so that one, that, that, that one's kind of nice. You do have to shampoo the beard because, um, you know, you want it to look like fluffy and nice. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's like, believe it or not, I can, you know, I can shampoo the beard, brush the teeth. Um, you know, uh, people always ask, like, how do you how do you do the shirt? Um, you know, like a button up shirt. And so I'll, I'll button it to like the next to top button and then I'll slip it over and then I'll button the, button the top button with my teeth. Um, and, and so that's how I do stuff like that. There's always like a little, there's always like a life hack or workaround uh, for, for, for most things. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of times it just means being, uh, being creative and using the, using the toes as the feet, that's for sure. Yes, yes sir. Oh, absolutely. So his, his, his question was, do I get to mess with people? Um, I wish I had the picture, um, but a few years ago, my wife was a fine art and design major in college. And, um, and so one Halloween, we were like, let's have a lot of fun with this. And, um, and so we, 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 took a, we took a white t-shirt, we cut up the sleeves really bad, and then we took uh, corn syrup and red dye. And um, and bro, I mean, and I mean, even liquid latex, like she found liquid latex, bro, we made it look pretty gnarly. Um, and then, and then one of, one of my buddies is a literal lumberjack. And so he had like one of these, like, it's like two and a half, three foot, like professional chainsaws. We took the chain off. Um, but he chased me around town with the, <laughs> with the chainsaw. And it was, it was really interesting because like, especially in interacting with adults, like you could see on their face, I know this is not real, 
but this sure looks it, you know? And, uh, and there would be like this look of concern on their face. And so, yeah, you can, uh, you, you can have a lot of fun with the, with the whole armless situation. That's, that's, for, that's for sure. That's for sure. Yes, sir. I do, which just means I'm a miserable football fan. Um, every, every fall, they find a way to shatter my heart. Um, so, but yes, sadly, we, we, are, we are Panthers fans in the, in the Richie household. Are, are you a Panthers fan? Or are you, why? Why? <laughs> you, you must be a patient man. Well, well done. Well done. All right, what else? What else? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay, okay. So I'll do the salvation story here. Uh, we'll, we'll do it about half an hour in worship, okay? Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to over, overplay my, my hand. Um, but, uh, but I will say, so I met my wife. Um, I met her in college. Uh, we were working in, uh, in a Christian camp in the mountains of North Carolina. And, um, and so it was my second summer, her first summer. And, um, and my wife, y'all, my wife is a stunner. Um, like six, she's six foot tall, um, just this beautiful blonde girl. And, uh, and man, she walks in like that first day at camp and I'm like, oh, uh, who, who, who's that? Um, you know, and, uh, and, and I mean, definitely, I think like a lot of us men sitting in this room, uh, I was out of my league a hundred percent. And, um, but it was just like, I don't know, man, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot my shot with this girl. And, uh, and it was funny, man. We met, and it was not fireworks at all. It was just kind of like, if you could have a sound effect for first impression, it was like, wah, wah. Uh, it, was, it was not great. Um, but I think, I always joke I just wore her down, um, was, was what it was. And, um, but, I mean, we met, in, we met in May of 2005, and we were engaged in October. Um, and, uh, and so... I guess I wore her down really quick, um, but yeah, we were, and then we were, we were married the next summer, but yeah, we, we met in ministry, you know, dealing with a bunch of crazy middle schoolers and high schoolers, and I, I guess, I guess if you can navigate that together, you can do just about anything, so it was, it was a good, uh, a good int- introduction to, to married life, that's for sure. Oh man, I know short short sleeve shirts are long sleeve for me. Um, I don't own a single pair of socks. Um, I uh, I usually wear shorts year round. I only I only preach in pants. Like even in snow, I wear shorts and I'm and I'm a barefooted hippie. Um, so yeah, closet space is tremendous. Um, my glove collection is very small. Um, you know, it's like you can, you, yeah, you 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 can play with a a lot of the, a lot of the closet space stuff. That's for sure. Oh yeah, that, that's a great question. So the as as a child, the Shriners offered to pay um, for the surgery, but I mean it was crazy. Gosh, in late '80s, it was quarter million um, just to do prosthetics. And then, it, I mean, it was like medical technology in the 80s was a little bootleg, um, shall we say. And I mean, it was like, I think the arms came with like a 30-minute charge or something like that. So it's like, great, I have limbs that work for 30 minutes and then we're done for the day. Um, and so it, to me, it just wasn't worth it. Um, and I mean, you know, I will say medical technology has come a long way in, in, in 30 years um, for sure not quite where I want it to be because, I mean, it's like I'm still just far more radically efficient with, with my feet than, than even prosthetics uh, are. But if we get to the point where it's like Tony Stark Iron Man arms, I'll, I'll be one quarter of a superhero, you know? Like, uh, but, but yeah, n- n- until we get to that place, yeah, I'm, I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be pretty content with the, uh, w- with the feet, that's for sure. You know what? I am terrible at soccer, because um, I'm like, I'm, I'm a little bit of an aggressive personality, I'm, I'm a competitive guy, and, uh, and I kept getting red cards, because I kept hurting people, um, so, so I actually, I actually, I, I played football in high school and middle school, because they, uh, they let you hit people in football, and so that was, that, that was more my speed, that's, that's for sure. Yes, ma'am. 
Yeah, so I, I, I have an older brother who's in the U.S. Special Forces, um, and so, uh, you know, one of us introduces people to Jesus, and the other introduces people to Jesus, um, shall we say. Um, so we're, uh, we're, we're a little, little bit of a dynamic duo, but yeah, he lives in, uh, he lives in San Diego, but, um, but yeah, I mean, he, I, I, I always say I got the brains and the beard, and he got the brawn and the beauty, because um, he's, he's 6'5", 220 pounds, I mean, he is a, he's a enormous human being, uh, for sure, but, uh, so yeah, we're, we, we could not be any more different, but yeah, that, I, I love him, man. Yes, sir. Yep, yep. So I mean, just I'm I'm driving a rental car from the Philly airport. Um, just a just a normal normal car. Um, left left foot up on the steering wheel, right foot for the pedals. So it uh, you get you get in some interesting conversations at the rental car place. I can. I can guarantee you that, because uh, most most guys think they're on like a hidden camera show or something. Um, so yeah, it's 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 never a dull moment. That that's that's a hundred percent for sure. Well, no, because it's funny, because I mean, it's like you know, I, I have a, a legit license, uh, and then um, you know, I I travel about half the year. Um, and, uh, and so I rent a lot of cars. And so when they look, you know, when they look up my account at enterprise, I mean, I'm platinum. And, uh, and so they're like, they're, they're, they're like, oh, he's done this quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, it leads, leads to a lot of, a lot of, uh, of interesting looks and conversations. Yeah. Yeah. This, this side of the room's awfully quiet. Um. Uh, Man, y'all, y'all are, y'all are my chatter. See, see, she's living it. She's living. All right, I'll just be really loud. Sorry, I just like. So that's all it is. Yes, ma'am. No, so so no medical reason at all, man. They they took me through like. Uh, a battery attest as, as, as a child and the man just came away with no definitive reason at all. Um, you know, I mean, obviously my parents are like, I can give you one reason that it's the Lord, uh, but that doesn't make medical sense. But, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely nothing in, in like my genetics that would tip, tip the hand towards that. Yeah. Yeah. So two ultrasounds, they didn't catch it. Um, so no, nobody actually knew that I, that I was armless. So, yeah, 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 it's kind of wild. All right. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, really, the, the, I'm, much of that insecurity and, and just walking through it, I mean, it, I mean it's just truly a, the, the, the work of Christ. I mean, just knowing and understanding who I am and, and what, and, and, and for me to find that worth and not in how the world sees me or how I see myself, but truthfully, like how, how God does, um, I, I think in really, I mean, going all in, in, in that understanding is what helped me, um, I, I think, to navigate that insecurity. But I mean, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, even today, it's still, you know, it's not easy, uh, for sure, um, especially as a daddy. Um, you know, it's like my, my 10 year old, huge football fan. He would love to go in the backyard, play catch with dad. Um, you know, he could, he could do that with any other dad on the planet. Um, or, or like my little girl, she is the clumsiest thing on the face of the earth. And, uh, and so she falls a lot. And so again, you know, the, those, those paternal instincts, you just want to go over there and scoop your little girl up and hold her and tell her it's going to be okay. And, you know, I can't, I can't do that. And, and so there's times, especially when, when I look at, at, at my role, I think, as both husband and daddy, that's where the insecurity kind of rears its head. Um, but I think, again, it, it just takes me back to that place where it's like I'm, I'm, not, I'm not defined by this whole armless thing. I'm not, I'm not my, my worth either as a man or a dad or a husband um, is defined by Christ. And so it's, it's that constant war, man, you know, of trying to push back against the lies and, and trust in what, what God has promised and what God has said. 
What else? I think, I think we got time for a few more. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it truly depends on just the dynamic. I would, I would probably say about 80% of the time it is just strictly motivational in schools for sure. Um, depending on where I am, like small town south or like Texas or, or something like that, they're like, oh, yeah, give him Jesus, you know, um, they, they, like they don't care uh, at all. Uh, and, and so in those times, man, yeah, I'll definitely, I'll leverage that opportunity. But more often than not, it's, they're, they're pretty specific. And if you say anything about Jesus, you're probably going to get sued. Um, so that, that's usually, usually the dynamic. Oh, all the way in the back. I like it. Man, it, I mean, literally, my parents said it was like moment one. Um, you know, they would talk about me as a kid. Um, you know, you, you sat me down with like hot wheel cars and blocks. I was like every other red blooded American boy. I would stack up the blocks with my toes and then crash the hot wheel car into them with my feet. You know, it was just like there, there was just very much so this, this natural understanding of, um, all right, this is what I got. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna roll with it. All right, we got we got time for one more. Who want, who wants to who wants to close this out strong? Okay, okay. She's like, I'll I'll, I'll t- yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's definitely interesting for them because it's like you know I think they're still at the age where. They, I mean, obviously, they know dad's different, but I don't think they know it's like I'm different, um, you know, because um, it's just for both of my kids, it is very matter of fact, like, oh, yeah, my dad doesn't have arms. Your dad has arms. That's weird, um, you know, uh, so it's like I think I think they've normal normalized it in a way. But then it's cool, too, because it's like um, my little six year old. uh it, it, it was right at Christmas. She's in she's in like this dance group, and um, and they were walking in like a Christmas parade in the community where we're from. And um, one of her older dance mates, she was like crying off to the side, scared because she didn't she didn't want to walk, you know, in front of such a big crowd. And my little girl comes up to him and she's like, "Well, you know what? Like my daddy doesn't have arms, and and he tries to deal, with, you know, with with just everyday stuff. And my daddy hates people, and you know what? He 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 has to go talk to people a lot. Um, but uh, but she's like, you know what? My my daddy my daddy asked God for for strength in, in the midst of all of that. And so she's like, I know he can do that for you too. You want me to pray for you? And so it's like it's it's pretty cool because even my kids or like leveraging um, just God's grace in the midst of my story, even in their relationships. And so it's like, you know, def- definitely makes me, a, makes me a proud papa, that's for sure. So, well, listen, let me, let me pray for us real quick, and then um, do, am I giving it back to somebody, or are we just taking a, well, okay, we'll, 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 t- we'll, take, a, we'll take a 15 minute break, and then you'll gotta, you'll gotta put up with me a little more. So um, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your grace. Um, towards us, um, both in, in just so many of the graces that we get to enjoy in this life. Um, but I think God just also just your picture of grace in pursuit of us in both your love and, and expressed in your gospel. Um, Father, this morning, I just pray, uh, maybe for us as dads, uh, to see our life and our role, uh, through that lens. Um, but for all of us, just as believers, as, as image bearers, um, God help us to to be people who go and show the world more of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning, church. How we doing? Morning. morning. All right. We got we got a couple bright-eyed, bushy-tailed folks. So I, I appreciate that. Um, listen. Let me let me say first and foremost, man. Happy Father's Day to the to the dads in the room. Um, man, I, I I think like we just saw in the video, man. I think it's. Um, for for uh, for a lot of us, it is it is the the true picture of of uh, superherodom, 
Um, and, uh, and so grateful for so many of you uh, who, who have come, who brought your family here this morning, man. We're, we're grateful for you. Listen, what I want to do uh, this morning is, uh, is I do want to share just a little bit of my story because um, I, do, I do think it, it lends itself in, in, in so many ways to, to Father's Day and, and just the, the difference that a, that a good dad makes. And, and I think in so many ways it's not, um, not glorious, it's not... Um, uh, it, it doesn't often get, I think, external praise, but um, man, God has plans um, just in, in the midst of uh, our lives that show itself in, in so many small ways, in so many subtle ways. Um, and, uh, and, and as I was praying, I was like, man, how do, you, how do you start off Father's Day with like something manly? You know, like, like you know, I, I don't have big biceps. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Your, your, your boy doesn't like hunt and shoot stuff. And so I was just like, what's the manliest story I got? Um, and, uh, and, and so here, here's my manly story. A couple years ago, um, I'm in the Denver airport. I'm flying back to North Carolina. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's like if you've flown even remotely recently, um, it's not a fun adventure, uh, shall we say the least. And then it's like when they, when they get you on board, it's like one clump of humanity um, that they just shove on the plane all at the same time. And so it's like we're getting on the plane in this like big ball of people. And, um, and as we're like shuffling on, there's this dude beside me and he is just staring at my empty sleeve. And, um, and now listen, like some of you men in the room, you might be like me, my native language is sarcasm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an English speaker second, sarcasm speaker first. And uh, man, I'm about to clap back at this dude and shut him down. And before I could say anything, home, exactly, I'm right there with you, girl. Um, before, before I could say anything, homeboy goes, was it a bear? And, and it, and in, and in my heart, I'm like, he, he can't be, he can't be this dumb. Like, there's, there's no way. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I asked for clarification, not to assume my man's intelligence. And, uh, and I go, was it a what? And he goes, a bear, the arms, was it a bear? And I was like, all right, we're going to do this. Um, and, uh, and so the only thing I could think to say to him was like, I looked at him and I'm like, bro, is this like when we're sitting in church on Sunday? And the pastor is starting to finish up his sermon. And then, you know, your, your stomach's like, and you're hungry. And it's just like, you realize probably like a whole lot of you are right now. Like you're hungry. You're thinking about your, your Father's Day dinner and you want fried chicken. But it's not like you just want any fried chicken. You don't want chicken thigh or chicken breast. Like you just want some good old fashioned chicken legs. That's just the mood you're in. Did this bear wake up? One morning, his, his little bear tummy was like, Roar. and he's like, you know what? I don't, I don't want like a people head or, or like squishy people middle. I just want some good old fashioned people arms. Like that's the only thing, that's the only thing that's going to make me a happy bear. You telling me I met the pickiest bear in the woods and he went for the arms and, uh, and he kind of, he's like processing through it and he goes, no. <laughs> and I'm like, that's right, you moron. No. And, uh, and then it was like immediately, as soon as like the word moron left my mouth, I was like, that's not my greatest moment. Like, I'm, you know, here I am like a pastor, love God, love others. I just called another human being a moron. God in his judgment, um, put me on the middle seat for that flight, which <laughs> You know, you, you guys know the, the jockeying for the armrest that goes on in the middle seat. When you don't have arms, you just lose. Like, you just lose that battle. And so I snuggled with two very burly men from Denver to Charlotte, North Carolina. And the whole time, I could, the only thing I, th I could think of was how much of a jerk I was. And, um, and so it's like somewhere, somewhere over like Nebraska, I'm like, you know what, I want to I want to be the bigger man. I want to go apologize. And so, you know, we finally land in Charlotte and, you know, everybody gets up to get their bags and stuff. And I'm trying to find the homeboy that, that thought a bear ate my arms. And he was in first class, of course. And, uh, and so he got off the plane way before I did. I was in the back by like the bathrooms. And, uh, and so it's like, I get off and I'm sprinting through the airport. I'm trying to find this dude. And, um, and I'm running and I see him coming from like far off and I'm like, yeah, it's my chance. I'm going to find him. But then it was like panic 
sets over me because it's like, you know, you guys with your handy dandy fingers, if you don't know somebody and you're trying to get their attention, you know, you just tap them on the shoulder. Um, and, you know, they're like, yes, can I help you? I can't do that. And, um, and so I'm racking my brain. I'm like, what? what do I do? And so as gently as you could headbutt another human being, I, uh, I like, I buddy bump homeboy on the shoulder. And he turns around, I guess he was like, this, this dude was kind of high strung or something. Cause it's like his fists were balled up. Like he was ready to, to deck me in the face. And I'm like, don't hit me. I'm unarmed. And, uh, and you know, it's like, yeah, he kind of, he, he had a little chuckle there for a second. It, it just sort of mellowed him out. And, um, and I looked at him and I was like, hey, man, listen, uh, I'm sorry I called you a moron. And he's like, I'm, I'm sorry I thought I buried your arms. You know, we had, a, we had a little moment. And then it was like, you know, then all the questions um, just started to come out of him. Like, hey, how'd you, so how did you lose your arms? Or how do you do this? And it was just like, man, I got to, I got to share my, my testimony with this dude. And so um, I, I think to the, the, the short of my testimony, much like I shared with that guy, uh, man, this is just the way I was born. Um, you know, this is, this is all I've ever known. And kind of like I shared in Sunday school, the, the wild thing in that is that nobody knew that this was what was coming. Like mom had a healthy pregnancy and two ultrasounds. And so the expectation was to have a healthy baby boy. And so literally nobody knew anything was wrong until the doctor is holding me in the delivery room. Um, and in that moment, like not only was was I armless, but I was I was lifeless. I was not breathing. I was not moving. Um, the doctor moved real quick to try to find a pulse on me, and he, he couldn't even find a pulse. And so what the doctor just did was he he turned to my dad very quickly, and he held me up so dad could see that I didn't have arms. And then he just really simply asked my dad, "Do you want us to let him go?" Because the you know I, I I think in the very much a worldly sense, it's like my life doesn't make worldly sense. That's for sure. I mean, it's like, you know, think about your Sunday, you know, and, and I know that the day is pretty young, but just all of the things you've done from, you know, hitting the snooze button on your alarm clock this morning, making breakfast, getting ready, um, getting dressed, driving here. Could you imagine doing all of those things without the benefit of your fingers, your thumbs, your hands, your arms? And so in, I think in so many ways in a, in, a, in a world made by people with arms, for people with arms, my, my life doesn't make a whole lot of worldly sense. And, um, and I'm so incredibly grateful. That, and, and I mean, it's like, as I take a step back as a daddy of two myself, to imagine what had to be going through my dad's brain, you know, in, 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 in just that split second. And... Um, and, and, and my mom said, like, dad didn't hesitate. Dad didn't stutter. He just, he just really simply said, that's my boy. And you're going to do whatever it is that you can do to try to bring him back. And, um, and man, by God's grace, you know, doctors rush me out, start to work on me. And, and, and by, by God's grace, man, I, I was brought back to life. And, you know, so doctors, doctors bring me back in. And, um, and it was crazy, though, in the next, like, I don't know, 48, 72 hours that, that we were there in the hospital. Um, like my parents were told um, by either orthopedic specialists, pediatricians. I mean, gosh, I probably saw every doctor in the hospital um, in those two or three days. My parents were told everything from I was never going to feed myself. I was never going to write. I was never going to go to normal school. I was never going to graduate. I was never going to be a fully functioning independent adult. And my dad remembers kind of like as, as, the, as the day like faded into night and the doctors left and it was just my mom and my dad. The, the one thing my dad clung to is that, you know, God in his grace is not going to call me from death to life and then go, all right, I did my job. All right, I did the miraculous. The rest is up to y'all. Um, you know, my, my dad was really clinging to the fact that it's like, God has a plan for this boy. I have no idea what that plan looks like. I have no idea how I'm going to raise this boy, but we're, we're going to make the most of the, of, of the kid that God has given us. And, um, you know, the, the, the short of it is just that man, dad, dad really did see me as just a, just a picture of God's grace. Um, dad saw himself as, as, as my greatest challenger, um, and, and my greatest encourager. Um, you know, my dad, Growing up, he made it a cuss word in our house if I said I can't, 
um, which is slightly problematic um, when you're trying to learn how to do everything with your feet um, because you say I can a lot. And, um, but my dad, I think, fully understood just from conversations with doctors and stuff that if they did everything for me, if, if they tried to make things easier for me on the front end, it was going to make things a whole lot more difficult for me on the back end because I'd be dependent on everybody for the rest of my life. And so dad took the tough road um, with me. And, um, and I would say both the combination of the grace of God and then the grace of my parents, man, all those things I was never supposed to do. It was like God was like, ha, watch this. And, um, and you know, it's, uh, I mean, truthfully, um, the short of it, whatever you guys do with your hands, I do with my feet. I mean, writing, eating, uh, typing on a cell phone, driving a car, um, using a chainsaw, which is probably not exactly <laughs> advisable, um, you know, in, in my situation. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, truthfully, it's like I, I grew up with, with a dad that treated me just like my brother. My older brother is 6'5", 220 pounds, and is in the U.S. Special Forces. And so homeboy kills people for a living. And, um, and they, they raised us the exact same way. I mean, my, my Saturday morning chores was we, we live on an acre and a half in, in, in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina. And, um, and, and so my Saturday morning chores was I would mow our acre and a half, and then I'd weed eat our acre and a half. You've never seen an armless man weed eat. Um, it, is, it is not efficient. Um, it is not fast. But, I, I mean, I think in so many ways, Dad was even using that moment to, to, to prepare me and to, um, to, to mold me into the man that I am. And so, you know, I, I look back now on, on 38 years of life, and I don't feel like I've missed out, man. You know, I, I graduated high school with honors. I went to college on a full scholarship. I met the girl of my dreams there in college. We've been, we've been married 16 years. We've got a 10-year-old, a 6-year-old. And I, and I have a ministry that, truthfully, I wouldn't trade the world for. Like, my, my physical body has never been an issue for me. Um, but I think from, I mean, truly my early years of life, even till now, like, my, my greatest struggles have always been, like, emotional and spiritual. Um, my greatest struggles have been comparative. And, and I think... In the, in the visual generation that we live in, I think, you know, shout out to my millennials in the room. Um, you know, it's like for those of us that are so visually oriented and, you know, our, our lives are based around apps. Um, I remember growing up, I would compare my life to everybody else. And when everybody else in your life has arms and you don't, it puts you in a bad spot, you know? and. Um, and I remember feeling like I was less than as a kid because I had to eat with my feet. Or um, I remember feeling broken because, I, you know, it's like, y'all, I can't, I can't go into McDonald's. I can't go into Walmart. I can't go anywhere without getting stared at and pointed at and people taking, like, low-key iPhone camera photos of me. Um, and so growing up, I would get into this place where it's just like I, I, I hated myself, where I hated others. And I, and I question the grace of God in my life, if I'm completely honest. Because here's what I did. I used my circumstances to define the grace of God in my life. I would look at me, and I would know. You know, it's like, like a lot of us. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We, we've, we've heard it. We know it. But I would wonder, why doesn't God love me like he loves you guys? God loves you all. He gave you ten fingers and two arms. You know, what, what, what I do wrong? And, um, and I just remember going into my teens, and I was just done. Done with me, done with everybody else, done with God. And, um, and I was just, uh, I was a loner. I was depressed. I was frustrated. I was, I was just checked out in every conceivable way. And I got used this kid in, in my biology class in high school. He invited me to a, uh, a youth group lock-in. That's all he told me. And so I, was, I had no friends. And, uh, and so for somebody to, like, invite me to come hang out, I was like, oh, a friend. And, uh, and so I show up. What homeboy neglected to tell me was this was a youth group dodgeball lock-in. <laughs> if you've ever wondered what an armless pinata looks like. Um, that, that was me that night. I get beaten to death for like the first four hours of the night. And, uh, and like around midnight, this youth pastor, he gets up, he gives a devotion on, on the love of God, like literally as I'm icing my face from getting like pummeled. And, um, 
and the night went back on and you know guys went back to playing dodgeball and I just sat out I was done I was frustrated and um and this youth pastor I think he, he noticed me loafing and off to the side and and so he comes up to me, starts to talk to me, and it's small talk, like him and I had never met. Hey, what's your name? Where you go to school? What you like to do? And it was just wild, because it was just like in that moment, the Holy Spirit, I think, just impressed on this guy, just the, the hard place I was in. And, and this youth pastor asked me, he's like, hey, you don't, you don't really seem to like your life. And I'm like, no, dude, like there's, there's nothing good about this. You know, it's like you just told me about the love of God, and I don't, I don't see it. I don't see God's love anywhere in my life. And this man, for, for at least the next hour, he just starts to walk me through scripture and the picture of God's love towards me and how he's made me. Like the psalmist says in Psalm 139, God has fearfully and wonderfully made each and every one of us in this room. Like God knew what he was doing when he made you. God knew what he was doing when he, he made me. And, um, and I think for us to understand that God shows his love and his intentionality and how he forms us to display his glory in all the world. But then God also shows his love for us in this, is that while I sat in that gym that night and I was a sinner and I had rebelled against God and I was done with God, God shows his love for me in sending his son to live the perfect life I couldn't live, to die the death that I should die as someone who's a sinner and is a rebel. God raises him to life to show his power over both sin and death and to all who rest in him as Savior and Lord and King. God adopts him into the family of God and then he sends him out on the mission of God. And I mean, man, for me to see God's love for me through, through his eyes and not mine, it, it changed my life. And to trust in and rest in what Jesus had done, what Jesus said about me, and, 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 and even me in the midst of my frailty and my brokenness. I mean, it, it gave me everything I needed to, to not only move forward in this life, but to, but to have hope in eternity. And I think for some of us today, whether you're sitting in this room and you're a daddy, whether you're sitting in this room and you're a kid, a mom, I, I think for us to fully understand our life to be defined by the person and work of Christ is, is where we need to be. And so I just briefly want to share with us, John chapter 9 is where we're going to be this morning. So if you, you brought a copy of God's word, uh, John chapter 9, we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Um, but I think it's like, especially as, as we get ready to read this, it's incredibly important to understand like this whole gospel. And it's like John, John puts his, I guess almost his summary statement of the whole gospel at the very end of the book in John chapter 20, verse 31, he says that each of these words are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so it's like here you see that it's like this, this whole gospel is for us to understand that there's only one person in this world worth building our life on. It is not us. It is Christ. And then it, even like bookending this gospel in John chapter 1, we see in Jesus, we see in the beginning was the word, that word being Christ. The word was God. The word was with God. In him and through him, all things are made. In him is life, and that life is the light of the world. So you see on both ends of this gospel that Jesus is our life. Jesus is our everything. Jesus is our hope. And I think just as much as we see here in John chapter 9, if, if you're sitting here this morning and you don't feel like there's a whole lot of hope, you don't feel like there's a whole lot of redemption that's possible in your story, I would, I would challenge you to look at the, the life of this blind man we're about to read about. So read with me, John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And God's word says this, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it wasn't that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day because night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, Jesus spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so the blind man went and he washed and he came back seeing. Listen, just a, just a few things I want us to see from this scripture this morning that, that I think very much so we need to write. On, on each and every one of our hearts. And the first thing is this is, I mean, God loves you. 
And, and, and I know that I know that I know that it's like the, the vast majority of people that are going to grace the doors of a church on Father's Day. It's like, I, I think that's a fundamental place that we, uh, that we understand that Jesus loves me. But I mean, honestly, it's like, how many times do we truthfully forget that? I mean, if you look at the people of Israel in the Old Testament, one of their greatest legacies is their short-term memory loss when it comes to the love and grace of God. I mean, truthfully, I mean, it's like, think, think of the Exodus. God parts the Red Sea. God gives them a pillar uh, of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, gives them manna, gives them quail. And what happens as soon as Moses goes up to, to get the Ten Commandments? The people are building the golden calf because they've already checked out on God. And they're like, it would have been better if we were just in Egypt than dying out here. The people very quickly and instantly forgot the grace of God. And so the same is incredibly true for us. Our circumstances, more often than not, we will allow to dictate the grace and love of God in our life. And when hard times come, it feels like he doesn't love us. And I think the same is true for this blind man right here. I mean, it's like, you got to understand it in context in this day, like people with disabilities 2000 years ago do not remotely have the same treatment that we, we get nowadays. Like more often than not, when a baby was born with a disability, they were put in a clay pot and they were left off in the wilderness to die. That was, that was typically how kids that were born blind, kids that were born lame, kids even in my situation, they were, they were left for dead. Because you see the glimpse of it here when the disciples see this blind man, they go, hey, rabbi, hey, teacher, who screwed up that this guy was born this way? People with disabilities in, in, in Jesus' day and age, the culture assumed it was the picture of sin and the picture of demonic work. But I love what Jesus does. Because it's like, you've got to understand, this, this guy wasn't the destination. The blind man wasn't where they were going to stop. Like, Jesus and the disciples, they were going from point A to point B, and this dude was the detour. But Jesus takes the detour. Jesus stops. Jesus walks over to him. And now listen, like, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't say this here in John 9, but this is, this is just me inferring. But it's like somewhere in this whole story, Jesus has to stoop down so he can spit on the dirt, so he can make the mud and, and wipe it on the blind man's face. And in, 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 like in my mind's eye, like before Jesus is stooping to, to spit and make mud, I feel like Jesus stoops down to this blind man. And then he, he speaks the words over him that this guy wasn't born blind because of sin. I made him this way so that the works of God can be displayed in him. And I mean, it's like in, the, in this moment, like before, before the physical healing happened, like there, there, there was some emotional healing that needed to happen. There were some, there were some internal scars that needed to be dealt with. And, and so it's true for us. Like God clearly knows the, the path that you've walked. God knows your failures. God knows your sins. God knows your insecurities, your weaknesses. And you know what he says in view of all of that? He still loves you. And I think for us to not have that short-sighted understanding that it's like, man, God doesn't know what I've done. God wouldn't love me if he knew all the skeletons in my closet or all my failures or all the things I'm not. No, God knows exactly what you come with and he still pursues you and he still loves you. And the second thing is this, is not only do, does, does God love you, but God has a purpose for you. Don't miss the fact, don't, don't miss the fact right here in, in verse 3. Jesus answered, it wasn't that this man sinned or his parents, but it was that the works of God might be displayed in him. That's why he was born blind. Don't miss the fact, Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to heal him so that my works can be displayed in him. Jesus said, I made him blind so that the works of God can be displayed in him. I made him disabled so the world can see more of me in him. Some of you in here, you, you feel like a, a really poor display of, of God's grace and God's craftsmanship. You know, we see in Genesis chapter one, this like inner Trinitarian conversation when, when the Trinity says, let, let us make man in our image. Let us form and fashion man to display our glory in all the world. And, and like I shared with you guys, Psalm 139, God is forming and fashioning each and every one of us very specifically to display his image and his glory in all the world. Some of us in here, again, because of the comparative world we live in, we think that if, that if, we're, not, if we're not wordy people, if we're not natural-born leaders, 
if we can't get up on a stage and sing, if we can't lead a Sunday school or a small group, then what can God do with us? God, God clearly missed the boat when he made us, and, and that's not the case. There isn't a poor image bearer on this planet. Like, God, God knew what he was doing when he made you. Like, God made you for a reason, and that reason is for you to find yourself in him and then for you to live it out. As, as Jesus goes on to say over on in the next chapter, in John chapter 10, that the Christ has come to give us life and life more abundant. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy is sitting here reminding you day in and day out that you're not good enough, that God doesn't love you, and God has no purpose for you. And Jesus is standing there going, I love you, I'm pursuing you, and I made you for a reason. And for some of us in this room, we, we have to choose to trust that purpose. We have to choose to trust that love and to not allow our circumstances to define that, but to be willing to walk in it, to be willing to know and understand, I'm not going to be like any other person in this room. But God knew what he was doing when he made me. You know, it's like, same for me. It's like, I don't understand why God had to make me in such a way where it's like the wind blows too hard and I look like a windsock at the airport. You know, it's like, I don't, I, don't, I don't quite understand what God was doing when he did that. But I do understand that, that it is a part of his purpose. And, and that's the last thing I want us to see here is that as, as, Jesus, as Jesus proclaims his love, as Jesus proclaims his purpose, as Jesus goes on to heal this guy, what Jesus is doing is he's allowing this man, the rest of John chapter 9, what you see is God uses this blind man to turn his entire city upside down. Because, I mean, can you imagine, like, if there was just like, you know, uh, over, over by Chipotle, where, where I stayed last night, you know, pretty, pretty big intersection right there by the interstate, got hotels and all sorts of stuff going on. Could you imagine if there was like blind Bart, you know, blind Bart here in town, he always sat there. He begged every day. He had his little cardboard sign. Could you imagine if you drove by one day and Blind Bart wasn't blind anymore? You know, you're going to go like, hold up. Like, that. <laughs> this ain't normal. I got, I got a lot of questions. I mean, this is, what go, this is what's going on in, in this town here in John 9. Like, this guy was blind. Now he's not. And so the Pharisees want some answers. And what you go on to see in, in, in verse 25 is, is as the Pharisees are grilling this dude and telling him to shut up and calling him a liar, all this blind man has to say is he says, listen, I was once blind, now I can see, and the only person that can do that is God. So if you got any issues, you work it out with him, because I sure didn't make myself not blind. God uses the weak things in the midst of this city and in the midst of this circumstances to show the world more of him. God is asking each and every one of us, as Jesus tells everybody here, look in verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because night is coming when no one can work. Jesus puts out this call. This isn't like, John 9 doesn't say, Jesus turns around to the disciples like, hey, all-star team, hey, pastors, hey, deacons, I want you to go and take the gospel. Jesus is putting out this blanket statement to go to everybody who's listening, to the disciples, to the crowd that is inevitably gathered around them because everybody wants to hang out with Jesus, and even to this guy that was blind, to this guy that had no circle of influence, no education, no friends, no power, no platform. Jesus said, I want you to go. And that call for each and every one of us in this room in Christ is, is true. Jesus is calling you to go. He's calling you to leverage whatever you have, whether it's your, your family relationships, whether it's your job at your engineering firm or your job down there, down the road at Mina Key or what, whatever God has given you, he is asking you to leverage what you have for his glory and purpose and for you to just put your yes on the table as Romans chapter 12 says, that our one acceptable form of worship is to offer up our lives as a living sacrifice. That's what God is calling for each and every one of us to put our yes on the table before the Lord and to go, here I am, God. And, and I mean, it's hard. Like, it's hard when we get to that place and realize that this life is not about me and it's about him. It puts us in really uncomfortable places. You know, it's like, like I shared with you guys in Sunday school this morning. I hate people. Like, I am not, I, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. I, hate's a strong word. Um, so let me, let, me, let me walk that back. I don't like people. 
Um, is, that, is that better? Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm an introvert. Like if there was a disease that wiped out all you handed people, I wouldn't be sad. Um, you know, like it'd be a li- little bit more room to breathe, man. Like that, that's, that's how I operate. And, um, and, and man, for God to call me into ministry 20 years ago, I'm like, huh, you're crazy. Call me to be a vet. Don't call me to, don't call me into ministry. Like I don't, I don't like humans, but God still called. And God continued to work, and God continued to open doors, and God continued to challenge me. And, and at every stop along the way, I found myself really insufficient for the task. But the best part is, is God is calling us to trust him and not trust us. And I mean, man, even, even a couple years ago, um, I'm sitting on the back porch. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true, like, full-blooded southerner. So, you know, I'm sitting on the sunshine, on the back porch in North Carolina, drinking the only tea that the Lord has ordained, and that's sweet tea. Um, and, uh, and so I'm sitting there, and, um, and so full-blooded millennial, I'm scrolling Twitter, and, um, and I came across this article on Twitter, and, and at the time it was, it was explaining um, this abortion legislation that was going through the state of Virginia at the time. And, and what the state was trying to do was to open up abortions from conception until birth for any kid with any discernible disability whatsoever. And even the governor of Virginia, in explaining like some of the protections in this legislation, they, they even offered up a scenario in which a child could be born, could, kept, could be kept comfortable, and then a conversation could ensue between the doctor and the mother as to whether the baby should live or die. And man, you know, just reading that, it, it hit home. Because that, that was the conversation a doctor had with my dad the moment I was born. And, and, and I think of all of the things that my parents were told I'd never be, I'd never do. And y'all, I'm, I'm not a political person. Like I am, you know, hear me out. Like that, that's, not, that's not the space I operate in. I'm kind of like a, a Christ first, Christ and everything sort of dude. But I'm sitting here reading this article going, how many babies in the state of Virginia are going to be killed because we don't look like you? Or or how many babies are going to be wiped out because they don't have the same chromosomes that that the rest of us have? Or the same mental faculties? They're not any less of an image bearer than you are. Just because you came with two arms doesn't make you a better person than me. And so in that moment, it's like, I, I didn't feel like I could be quiet. But I didn't know what I could do. And so it's just like, in, in my ignorant millennial way, I just, I shot a video on my phone. I posted it on Twitter. That was, that was like the only thing I could think of to do. And it's just like, in this quick little video, I talked about that the sanctity of human life is grounded in the fact that the creator of life has formed and fashioned us, regardless of ability or disability, to show the world more of him and his grace and his glory. That my value doesn't come from my arms. My value comes from my maker. And... Um, and it was just wild that, I, I mean, in the next four hours, this, this Twitter video had been viewed about 60,000 times and, um, and it had been retweeted and shared and liked and all this junk. And by the end of the night, I had a, I had a DM from, from somebody at, at Fox News and they were like, hey, dude, we, 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 saw your art, we, we, we saw your video. That was pretty cool. Could you turn this into an article? And we would love to post it on our website tomorrow. And, um, and now listen, A... I'm an introvert, um, so this is terrifying. And then B, like, I'm not like a news person. Like, they're all a bunch of liars. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, this is, this is, not, this is not my thing. And, um, and so I was like, I know what will throw them off. I was like, and all I replied was, listen, all, I, I'm, not, I'm not like super smart. I don't have a master's. I don't have a PhD. All I can talk about is Jesus and, and, and armlessness. And so if you're cool with me talking about Jesus and armlessness, then we're good to go. I'm like, ha, that'll shut him down. All she replied was, that's nice. And I'm like, dang it. And, uh, and so, so that night I stayed up and, and I typed out a quick little 800 word article. I sent it to him. And of all things, like they ran this article the next day. And I mean, all it was, was, I mean, truthfully, it's just the sanctity of human life grounded in the creator and author of life. That's all I wrote. I mean, it was like theology 101, the Imago Dei. And so they ran this thing 
And, and of all articles that Apple News picked up as their one push notification for every Apple device in the United States for this one Saturday morning, it was that article I wrote. And, and in 24 hours, four and a half million people read this article. And so that night, Fox News, they doubled down, they called me, and they were like, hey buddy, um, that went really well. Uh, can you be on a plane and in New York City in, I don't know, 12 hours? Um, we'd, we'd like to have you on a show. And they said that, and I was like, huh, no. And, uh, and I just hung up the phone, because it's just like, I hate people. Like, <laughs> this is, I, I don't like four people, much less you'd like start counting them in millions and I'm out. And, um, and so... I hung up and, and I was in my office and like I walked back out into the living room and, and my wife, as discerning and far more intelligent than I am, she goes, hey baby, who's that? I was like, oh, it's Fox News. And she just thought, you know, they were wanting to give like feedback on, on, the, on the piece that I wrote or whatever. And she's like, oh, what'd they say? And I was like, well, they asked me to come on a show. And she's like, oh, how exciting. And I was like, no, uh, I may have said no. Um, and she's like, you may have done what? Like, I, I told them no, and, and how many of us as fathers on this Father's Day, our wife's the smartest member of the duo, um, because my wife goes, you had a chance to share the gospel with millions of people, and you tapped out. Yes, ma'am, I do believe that is what I did. Um, and, uh, and she's like, you going to call him back? I was like, I'm going to call him back. And, um, and so I called it no lie, three hours I'm flying from Charlotte to New York City. And, um, and like in this whole lead up in just a matter of four hours, it's crazy. Like y'all, all these shows, full disclosure, um, are scripted. And so it's like, I knew my questions that I was gonna get in advance. They knew my answers verbatim in advance before I got there. And so I'm just playing through everything through in, in, in my head. We get there, we start talking about abortion, pro-life stuff. Halfway through this interview, this, this woman that was interviewing me, Martha McCallum, um, she asked me a question that we hadn't talked through. We didn't clear, we didn't walk out. And she says, listen, something happened when you were 15 years old that changed your life. What was it? And I'm sitting here, I'm here, dude, I'm here to talk about abortion. And, and I'm like, uh, I didn't have an abortion at 15, I know that. And, uh, and it's like, you know, I'm racking my brain and it's just like, in an instant, like, it clicks that this woman wants me to talk about the night that I trusted Jesus as my Savior and Lord and King. And, and, and man, in that moment, for the next 45 seconds, I get to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with seven and a half million people. And, like, y'all, I've, I've preached 21 years. If I preach 21 more years, I'm not preaching to seven million people. But in that moment... God, God took this, this very ignorant, armless man from the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, and used him to display his gospel and his glory for all those people willing to watch. All of that in the midst of my insufficiency, my, my, my discomfort, my weakness, my failures. I say all that to say, like, y'all, if God can use this blind man in John chapter 9, God can use this armless man that, that's standing in front of you this morning. God can use you. If God can call you from spiritual death to spiritual life, in Christ you have a story to tell. In Christ you have a miracle to share with the world. And, and I don't think we can afford to be quiet about that. Like for us as the church, the most selfish thing that we can do is have the greatest, world, greatest news the world has ever known and to be quiet about it. Y'all, if, if we are in Christ, we have our opportunity to put our yes on the table before the Lord and God, our God. Here's my family, here's my job, here's my relationships, here's my power, here's my platform, here's all of me, use me for you. God, allow me to always have my yes on the table and to know that for the person that just trusts God with what he has, God will transform the world. And it might not be a Fox News interview, but it might be in a conversation with somebody you love. It might be a conversation with somebody that you walk the halls with at your work. It might just be loving your neighbor. Isn't that a radical thing? In this jacked up, contentious world that we live in, honestly, the most like countercultural thing that you can do is to be nice. And sometimes that's just, that's, that's what it looks like for us to put our yes on the table before the Lord. When the world says no, God says yes. And I pray that that would be true of us. Let me, let me pray for us. God, I just pray as we look at our life, as we look at your grace towards us, 
both through your gospel, through how you have made us, through just the daily graces that you give us. Father, I pray we would preach that love and that purpose to ourselves day in and day out, but that God, in view of that, we would go and we would share. We would go and love, go and serve, all by putting our yes on the table before you, all saying, God, here we are. Use us. Use us for your glory, for your grace, for your purpose. God, use us to change this community. Use us to change this world. And let it start with us, both personally and us as your gathered body of believers. Father, we love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. He really challenges us, doesn't he? That's God is able and he's big enough, right, to use us country folks in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Daniel, for your challenge, for your message, for your story. Uh, Don's going to come and lead us in a closing song, and then we'll uh, have a closing prayer. Turn to number 477. Nice number of fellows to put it on the screen, too. 477. I've been truly blessed to be here. How about you? Praise God, yes. If you're from my time, I listen to you again. <laughs> and this song says, make me a blessing. Each of us can be a blessing, just in a small way. Yes, yeah, still be singing. Rise to sing. Make me a blessing. in the highways and byways of life. Many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine when darkness is ripe. Making the sorrow bring glad. Make me a blessing. Make Blessing to somebody. Oh, surely, folks, I would just sing again. Give as was given to you in your need. Love as a master loves you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed. Unto your mission.
Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for, um, for being here today yes. to speak with us uh, through our brother. Thank you for um, bringing him here. And Lord, I pray that the message that he shared from you to us would not have fallen on deaf ears, yes. but that we would take it to heart and, and allow you, your glory, to shine through us to the world in which we live and move. Bless all the dads that are here today and, and uh, give them a good day as, at whatever they do. May the uh, Lord um, give all that they have to all of you as they live their life as the example you called us to be. Go with us, Lord, as we dismiss from this place. May we know your mercy and grace as we come into a new week. Whatever it is you have for us to do, may we do it heartily as unto the Lord. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Don't leave without saying hello to Daniel. Yes. And uh, yeah, have a great day. God bless you. <laughs>